Well, good morning and welcome. On behalf of TDJ, we'd like to welcome everybody for setting aside their uh, valuable time to spend uh, about 30 or 40 minutes with us here this morning. Um, just as a quick overview, um, what we're going to do is after we go through the presentation, I'll be prepared to address any questions that you might have. If you look in, should be in your upper right hand corner of your computer screen, there's going to be a dialogue box where you can submit questions. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. And at the very end of our presentation, which again should last about 30 minutes, I'll be prepared to address those questions. If it's a public question that you don't mind me addressing the question as well as the answer, submit it through this channel and we'll address it at the very end. If it's more of a private nature question, like you've got a question about a specific project you're working on or you're bidding on, and it's a little more private in nature, then you'll see that we've got our email address listed here at tdj at blastdocs.com at the very bottom of the screen that you're looking at, or feel free to call us at 800-252-7869. And just as the high level overview, a couple of things we're gonna be discussing today is we will be discussing some of the benefits of Blastox, which is a heavy metal stabilization reagent. But we really also hope to provide some educational information, including the different types of stabilization techniques that are out there, some different application and mixing techniques. We're gonna talk a little bit generically about heavy metal solubility and hopes to uh, impart some knowledge generically about those, those kinds of uh, systems there. So without any further ado, we're gonna go ahead and jump into the, the seminar here. So the very first question I'd like to address first is what is Blastox? Well, Blastox is a complex calcium silicate chemistry. It is a dry granular product, so it contrasts obviously with a liquid material. And for application on a job site, it tends to be a lot less messy when you're dealing with a dry granular material. A benefit of our production facility is we have the ability of, of manufacturing this product in a number of different particle sizes. Our three specific particle ranges are a minus 16 to a plus 50 mesh material. That's really a large sand size product that's used for sand blasting that I'll get to here in just a minute. Um, we also have a, a finer particle sizing material that's a minus 50 to a plus 400 mesh range. That is our Blastox 215 material that uh, is a product that's used quite a bit for soil application projects. Uh, we also have an even finer grade of material where everything is minus 300 mesh material. It is a very finely graded material that's intended to be injected into ventilation systems so the fine particle can be entrained so that it can co-mingle with materials or waste that are being generated from our foundry industry and those smaller particles then co-mingle with the dust coming through that ventilation system. So when they get into the back house, they're already thoroughly homogenized so that they can react with the heavy metals. We have three standard packaging uh, types, 70 pound paper bags that have a plastic liner in between the uh, multi-walled paper materials. We have 3,000 pound super sacks and we also have bulk uh, capacity as well. 3,000 pound super sacks tend to be the packaging of choice for most contractors because it's uh, easy for them to apply it on the job site and to store it if they don't have a large silo on site. Now the Blastox material can work on a wide range of RICRA 8 materials, but it was specifically designed to target lead and cadmium. We can, as this last bullet point does imply, we can add additional enhancements if we're working on um, other materials that would be present as a multivalent state, possibly. Uh, a very good example is chromium 
uh, in a form of hexavalent chromium, where those materials require a reduction oxidation additional step before the Blastox 215 can further uh, stabilize that material. And just moving from left to right, these again are the three specific products that we manufacture, but we can also custom blend these materials together. And we also have the ability of producing additional particle sizing based upon what the application would be. Moving from left to right, the Blastox material is a sand grain material, which is used for sandblasting of lead-based paints. Uh, water towers, petrochemical storage facilities, bridge structures that were painted with lead-based paint a long time ago create a toxic waste when removed. Our material is blended with various types of abrasive so that the Blastox material chemically reacts with the lead-based paint rendering it non-hazardous for local subtitle D disposal. Mm -hmm. The middle product there, Blastox 215, if you look around the perimeter of that pile there, you can almost see pepper-like flakes. This is a material that is primarily used for soil application. And then on the right, you can see it's a very powdery material that's more used for injecting in um, ventilation systems. So the small particle can be entrained. Um, it's interesting to note that we recently did a project out in uh, New England area where the Blastox 215 had the lowest dose rate, but we actually did a blend of the Blastox and the Blastox 215 where it took the ad rate from 3% up to 4%, but we used larger grains because this was in a very sensitive highly urbanized downtown area and dusting was was prohibited. So we ended up coming up with a blend for them that required a slightly higher dose rate, but achieved their goal of TCOP compliance, as well as keeping dusting to a minimum so there weren't any on-site issues or concerns. Um, this next slide here is more of a generic uh, listing of three different ways that you can achieve TCOP compliance, specifically with heavy metals. Any one of these three can be effective. As we'll find out, you need to be careful about which of these three you're rely, relying upon. This first one here is you can add materials like calcium oxide or magnesium oxide or alkaline materials to a TCOP test, and you can increase the pH to decrease the solubility of heavy metals. I'm gonna flash forward here to a graph just to show you what metal solubilities would look like. If you look up at the very top, we've got lead hydroxide, and if you drop the arrow down at the bottom of the lead hydroxide curve, you'll see the minimum solubility range is about nine and a half. If you look over to cadmium, which is the other um, heavy metal that Blastox is designed to, to attack, you'll see that the minimum solubility range for cadmium hydroxide is 11. So keep that in mind as we go back to the last slide where you can achieve TCLP compliance by simply adding a calcium oxide or a mag oxide based material to put the TCOP solution in that minimum solubility range. Now I would caution you on just relying upon that way to achieve TCOP compliance because once the buffering capacity goes away, in, in my view, it's not a matter of if, but when that buffering capacity gets eliminated, Unless you have something else there to keep the heavy metals from going into solution, you could have a future leaching issue. So we have pH adjustment in the first bullet point. The second bullet point that we have here is about chemical conversion, where you're actually creating a new heavy metal compound that's less susceptible to leaching. This is more of a long-term permanent ability to ensure that the heavy metals never leach again in the future. Uh, a third way to do that is there are materials that are out there which you could create a block, if you will, and the, the, the block of the waste matrix is effectively encapsulating 
the waste material so that you have a physical barrier helping to minimize the solubility or the release of those heavy metals. Now, ideally, you'd have a material that would adjust the pH. You would have a material that would create a new chemical compound for long-term stability. And you would also have the third safeguard where you're also creating an encapsulated waste to help to minimize future leaching. When you have all three of those, what you've really got is a good mousetrap that has multiple safeguards. And again, the goal there is you're reducing future liability for your property, or if you're a consulting engineering firm, you're helping to reduce liability on behalf of your client. Um, I'm happy to say that Blast Docs incorporates each of these three safeguards and in combination helps to assure that you have a long-term stable waste material. And then this is a graph that I had uh, uh, reviewed earlier, so I'll go ahead and move forward on that. The key part of this, however, is keeping in mind heavy metals, certain heavy metals do have the ability to leach at high pH values and low pH values, as is the case with these large U uh, solubility curves. The term for that is called amphotericity. So amphoteric means heavy metals leach at high pH values and low pH values, but have a minimum solubility range in this case, between 9 and 11. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about and provide some knowledge about the two types of soil leaching tests that are most encountered. The TCOP test is probably the most renowned leaching protocol that's out there because that's the de facto test to determine if a waste is hazardous or not hazardous. The TCOP test, if you look at that acronym, it's Toxicity Characteristic Leach Procedure, or in the field, we'll hear it call a, called the T-CLIP test. Um, the actual EPA test method is 1311. Basically what this leach test is, is it uses two different types of leaching medium, depending upon whether or not the waste is alkaline. If it's a non-alkaline waste, they'll use extraction fluid number one, which has a pH of 4.9. If it's more alkaline, and they determine this by doing a small sub-test or sub-sample of the waste that was sent in by adding um, some hydrochloric acid to materials, five grams of the material that's been added to 100 milliliters of deionized water, and then based upon how it responds to the dosing of hydrochloric acid, they either add extraction fluid number one or extraction fluid number two. Both extraction types are acetic acid based. So this test, if you, you think about how this test is working, it's got two liters of acid in a large container containing 100 grams of the sample and it's rotated for about 18 hours. And then at the end of that, the materials are filtered, digested, and analyzed for the amount of leachable or soluble heavy metals in this instance. The other test that is less frequently used, but it's a test that achieves a different um, result and that different result is, it's just not a matter of do we comply with the regulatory guideline of five milligrams per liter for lead in this instance, or is it a test that's designed to determine long-term stability? Well, as we go through the explanation of the multiple extraction procedure, it should become apparent that this test was specifically designed to eliminate buffering capacities that I mentioned earlier that a calcium oxide or mag oxide material could provide. It's intended specifically to eliminate that buffering capacity. And here's basically how it works. It is EPA test method 1320. There's just one extraction fluid that is sulfuric and a nitric acid blend. <clears throat> Keep in mind the TCOP test was an acetic acid blend that had a pH of, it had two different extraction fluids. Well, this material, when the waste, you still take 100 grams of waste, 
you put it in your vessel with the acetic acid, but instead of running one cycle, it's actually 10 cycles. And instead of each cycle being 18 hours, the cycles here are 24 hours. So after you analyze it the first time, you take that sample that's been ran through the acid bath once, and you put it back into a fresh bath of acid for another 24 hours. So our extensive experience with this is by the third or fourth extraction, if you're simply adding a pH buffering material, you're going to eliminate that pH buffering material. And if there's nothing else there keeping the material from going into solution, then what you're going to have is a potential future leaching condition. So the, the third bullet point here is very important because this test was designed by EPA to predict the long-term stability of waste by eliminating the pH buffering. Now, as I alluded to earlier, you can achieve a pass on the TCLP test. However, it does require some very careful dosing. And in the field, because things might not be as precise as what they are in a lab, it, you have to be very careful about how you do that because if you add too much, you could actually cause the materials to leach at a higher rate than what they were before you added anything. So the, the summary of the MEP test is it was designed as a long-term stability test but specifically designed to eliminate the pH buffering effect. As I alluded to earlier, Blastox does have a pH buffering effect. That was one of three safeguards, but I can tell you that Blastox will pass and has passed many multiple extraction procedures. Um, so much so that not only did we uh, perform our own MEP testing at a number of commercial laboratories, but because we were doing so much work back in the late 90s with the infrastructure throughout the country, with bridge, bridges in particular, we had a couple pretty recognizable and reputable agencies come knock on our door and said, we know that you're complying with TCLP testing, we need to determine if your material is long-term stable. Um, the summary for each of these, which again, the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Highway Administration, which is responsible for all transportation uh, projects that occur uh, on the federal level, but in particular bridge structures that would have lead-based paint, they had conducted their own series of tests as well as the U.S. Department of Defense through the Army Corps of Engineers Research Laboratory that was located down at the University of Illinois. The long of the short of their conclusion, using MEP testing, um, and I should also add that if you were to run an MEP test yourself, that cost is going to be about $2,500 to $3,000 per test. So you can see that the EPA had spent a lot of money just running the MEP test, where they ran 46 different combinations of waste in our material. And their conclusion was that blast stocks waste exhibited long-term immobilization and durability. Federal Highway concluded stabilization was very effective when using MEP. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, uh, under the umbrella of the U.S. Department of Defense concluded there is no laboratory evidence of problems associated with their long-term stability. So the bottom line from our perspective is these are, I, I would hesitate to say endorsements, but from our perspective, it's a stamp of approval. Well, three independent reputable agencies all ran their independent testing and they all concluded the same. Blast stocks is a long-term stable material. So having talked a little bit about generic ways to stabilize a waste um, and how the blast stocks material itself would work, talked a little bit about the various types of testing protocols that are out there. Now I want to talk a little bit about how much reagent to add. Um, clearly, I'm uh, representing TDJ and Blastox as a material that we manufacture, but really these, these uh, next set of bullet points I'm going to go through 
this would be applicable whether you use blast docs or some other type of powder reagent. So the first thing we would prefer to do is get a sample and do testing. Um, as I mentioned earlier about the project up in New England, we had the ability uh, to obtain samples that they had collected during site characterization, and they had sent us a sample from the highly or the highest contaminated area. We've done the testing and determined what the dose rate was. If it's pretty homogenous, um, we would just recommend that we get one or at most two samples to do testing. If you have a high degree of variability, let's say we have areas where it's greater than 100 milligrams per liter and an area where it's less than 100 milligrams per liter, if it's a very large project, sometimes it makes sense to segregate those because you can hit one with, let's say, a four or five percent dose rate if it's greater than 100 milligrams per liter, and we can get down to two or three percent for areas that only leach five to 50 milligrams per liter. So if we have high variability and we really want to optimize the dose rate, we would need a sample from each area and we, we would need about one quart of each sample. And as the first bullet point alludes to, we provide that testing complimentary, meaning that we will pay for that testing because we want to demonstrate to you that the material is effective. And as I kind of glossed over, these are general ranges of the amount of our material based upon looking at a lab report in the event that samples aren't available. And as I said, if it's five to 50, 3% has proven to be very effective. If it's 50 to 100 or more, 5% um, has also demonstrated to be very effective. But I do want to point out the project that I was mentioning up in New England, um, it leached at 180 milligrams per liter and we successfully stabilized it to non-detectable levels that was be below the reporting limit for that particular lab with only a 3% ad rate. So I've tried to be conservative here and give you some general guidelines, but many times the material can work at even lower ad rates than, than what we have listed here. So please keep that in mind as you're you know, looking on existing projects or any upcoming projects. Now, uh, I know it's in the morning, and maybe we're not prepared to do any math exercises here, but if you can just bear with me for just a moment, I wanted to review how we actually calculate how much material, because there's two ways of doing it. Um, the way I'm gonna go through here is a preferred way to make sure that you have an accurate amount of material used on the project site. The larger the volume, the more critical it is to make sure we calculate how much material to add in this fashion. So we tend to sell our material on the tons metric, and most contractors and consultants look at a different metric, and that's cubic yards. So the first thing that we do is if you've got a specific conversion factor because you've got good uh, geotechnical knowledge of the soil, apply your conversion factor. Generally, we apply a conversion factor of 1.4, and then after we convert from cubic yards of soil to tons, you're going to take that tons and divide it by 1 minus the ad rate. So this ad rate here was 3%. So what we'll do is, the example is 10,000 cubic yards of soil, and we have a 3% ad rate. If we multiply the cubic yards by 1.4, we have 14,000 tons. Now, if you just multiplied 14,000 tons by 3%, you would get 420 tons of reagent. So keep that in mind. And then if we do it in this calculation, we take 14,000 tons and we divide it by one minus the ad rate in decimal form. Here the ad rate was 3% or 0 0.03, so it's 14,000 tons divided by one minus um, 0 0.03, which is 0.97. 14,000 divided by 0.97, we have a total, which includes the chemistry and the soil, 
of 14,433 tons. Subtracting that from the original calculation of 14,000 tons of soil, and we have a product of 433 reagent tons versus a 420 tons if we simply multiplied that. So that's a little bit of a, uh, a mathematical nuance but we believe this is the best method to calculate that to make sure you're applying the right amount um, on the job site that we've been able to do on a bin scale basis. So I'm gonna go through a couple of examples here of how to mix the blast dots material. And then I've got a set of about nine or 10 slides that go through three different projects, giving some pictures showing how people were actually able to take this concept and then using it out in the field. Um, for any first time users, um, we're happy to uh, send a rep out. Um, and I should mention, uh, we, we had a little technical difficulty at the very beginning of this presentation. The first slide did not pop up. The first slide was about TDJ Group, which is the manufacturer of this product and Jay Carpenter Environmental, who is our primary distributor for our soil product. So I apologize for that technical uh, mishap that we had, but we work together quite well with Jay Carpenter Environmental, who's a, a subsidiary of Carpenter Brothers. Uh, we've been working with them for nearly a decade, and we've got reps that we'll send out to the job site for any first time applicants. Well, one of the ways to do this, if you're going to mix it in situ, meaning you're going to mix it in the ground, is the first thing we need to do is go through the calculation on the earlier slide, determine how much of our material we need to add to the top of the soil. And let's say we have a 40 foot by 40 foot area, and we're going to dig down about two feet. We do the calculation there. We determine how much of our material we need to add. And then what we do is we take the super sacks, with the equipment that's on site, which again will be demonstrated with a few pictures here momentarily, and we open up the spout on the bottom of the bag, allowing the Blastox 215 to gently flow out of the bag on top of the ground. Once you have enough of that material, then you simply take the bucket and mix that material over while it's still in the ground. You collect your sample and send it in for confirmatory testing before you ultimately make your final disposal decision. That is one way to do it. Another way that's been quite effective, especially for larger volume projects is, let's say we've got a pile that's uh, a 50,000 ton pile that we're working off of 500 to 1,000 ton piles because mm -hmm. that's about what a contractor could do once they have their equipment and their system set up. So we'd pull 1,000 tons out of it and let's say your inloader holds five tons per bucket. Just as an example, you would know that you would need X buckets to be able to produce the thousand tons. Now, once you've got the right amount of material of waste over there, each bag contains 1.5 tons of our reagent. So you do the calculation and how much you would need to add to that smaller stockpile. Um, you apply the materials on the top of it. And then you simply, with the backhoe or the heavy equipment you have on site, you mix that material thoroughly so you've got good interaction between the chemistry, which again is a dry powder material, and you, you ensure that there's good uniformity in the mixing of the reagent and the soil. So those were a couple of examples of how you do it with bulk bags. Um, for really large projects, let's say we're, look, we're working on a 100,000 ton project, they'll want to tend to automate that so they'll have a portable silo on site, say a couple hundred tons, and then it will be better for us to deliver our materials in bulk pneumatic tankers that we can blow them into the silo. And then they'll have a large pug mill which has um, devices on the inside which will break up the soil and help to thoroughly homogenize it. So you would either gravitationally feed the material out of the silo into the pug mill or depending again upon the sophistication of the setup, you would 
um, have a blower on site and simply pneumatically convey the reagent into the pug mill, again, going through the proper calculations. Then you would activate the pug mill, ensuring that you've turned that material over at a minimum of five to six times. Um, regardless of whether you do it in situ, you do it as smaller stockpiles, or you do it on a bulk basis with a silo and a pug mill, you just need to make sure that you thoroughly homogenize it. And our experience has been, you don't want the lift to be deeper than four feet because it becomes problematic in being able to get the bucket down in and ensure that you've got uh, thorough mixing. Uh, the question many times that people ask is, well, how long do I need to wait before I collect a sample? And the answer is, you don't need to wait. Once it's thoroughly homogenized, you simply collect your sample and then send that sample in for testing. And even though we've already vetted out on a treatability bin scale basis that it works, we still want to make sure you guys get your results back first before you dispose of the material off-site. Again, making sure that there was nothing wrong in your calculation of how much material you added, or in the event that there was some you know, uniquely highly contaminated area, you still wanna make sure you get your confirmatory TCOP test back so that you've got a good basis for your disposal decision. So at this point, I'm gonna stop uh, just reviewing words with you and show you some pictures. Uh, which are just a sampling of the few of the many projects that we've uh, been able to su successfully supply with Carpenter Brothers. So as you can see in the background there, we've got the uh, kind of in the middle to the left, you'll see some soil that's exposed there. We've got the super sacks that are our super sacks. Uh, you, you you can kind of see a little bit of the writing on the bag to the left of these two bags that are being hoisted up on the bucket with a chain. Now some firms will have a little spreader bar or a contraption they'll set on top that just picks up one bag through the four, four stirrups or loops that you see up top. Other times it's just as easy if you got a, a series of chains and some hooks on the back of your bucket there, you can pick up a bag. And the, the idea behind that is once you hoist the bag, and I'll have a picture here in just a moment that'll have a better, better illustration, is there's a spout on the bottom that has one large rope on the outside. You cut that rope and pull the spout down it's got a secondary regulator or choker rope that's fully tied off when it's delivered to the job site. You simply untie that and loosen that up, and that will allow you to apply the material right on top of the, uh, the soil. This picture, if you look at the bag in the very middle, you can kind of see that rope sticking out of the very bottom of the bag there. Well, this was another project that was located in uh, downtown Chicago area. And you can see that two things to note here is one, he's, uh, he's already cut the outside loop. He's, pull, he's pulling right now the spout down. He's getting ready to open the bag so that the material can pour out gently. And then the heavy equipment operator will simply move or swing that bag back and forth just kind of feathering that material out. You should also note that the on-site worker there simply has a dust mask on, as well as a person in the background, and then they have rubber gloves. You know, we would recommend a long sleeve shirt and applying this as well. But what this really speaks to is our material, the Blastox 215, is a very innocuous material that doesn't have a high level of need to protect against exposure for your workers. So when you're dealing with heavy metals, hazardous materials, the requirements for protection against those will far exceed any PPE that you would need for your people in terms of exposure of the, our material to your people. And as you can see here, they've already applied the material and now he's just going through the motions of simply digging up the material to thoroughly homogenize it. Here's a little closer view of uh, the similar application. And finally, just simply raising the bucket up. 
Uh, what I'll also note is it's not present on this bucket, but what contractors sometimes will do is they'll draw a line, they'll paint a line on the bucket, knowing that we're only gonna go down two feet, and that gives them just a little bit better visual with which to stick down the ground, knowing that they only need to go down two feet or three feet or whatever depth they need to go down to. Here's uh, another project. This one happens to be in Southern Missouri, which if any of you know that area down there, um, it was renowned for its lead uh, rich um, soils that are down there. And in fact, there's you know, several operations down there that continue to extract lead as a valuable, valuable material and send it all over the world for processing and for use in things like a car acid batteries. <clears throat> as a result of it being present down there, there are many um, applications where our, our material can be used. And what, uh, what I'll note here is the heavy equipment operator there has just simply used a couple of chains and they've attached them to the stirrups or the loops. You can see the material is pouring out and you can see a couple of things. There is a, a pretty big difference between the soils and the light gray color of our material. So you have a pretty good visual discrepancy there. So you can see where you're adding it, where you haven't added that. And sometimes that can just be a good additional visual check to say, okay, we've got enough material in there, or we've hit that area over there. And he's just now going through the final step where he's going to be thoroughly homogenizing the material. And again, I'll note the contrast between the light gray color of our material and then the darker soils that you see there. So let me go ahead and just jump back into the presentation. We've got just a, uh, a couple more slides to go through here. This is a, a slide that talks specifically about the cost efficiency of using our material. <clears throat> so let me do this first. If you look down at the assumptions area, I want to review that with you so that you understand what is and what is not included in this analysis. So first, product freight is not included because this actually was a Midwestern project that had very little freight cost to it. But if you're talking about an application rate of three or five percent, and I'll note we used worst case scenario here because I want to give you guys kind of a, a good feel for even if worst case scenario, can we save money using this material? I've used five percent here. But if freight going all the way out to the east or west coast is let's say a hundred dollars per ton, if your application rate is only 3%, your additional add-on cost is only $3 per treated ton. So that's another reason not to add the freight here because at the end of the day, because the add rate is so small, um, I don't want to say it's irrelevant, but it's not a significant add-on cost. Um, there are many, many, many more non-hazardous subtitle D landfills throughout the country than subtitle C or hazardous waste facilities. As a result, freight going to hazardous waste landfills is a lot more expensive, not to mention the fact that those carriers also require additional training because they're transporting hazardous waste. Um, one uh, cost item that I have not included here is the cost to mix on site. Most contractors will use about a $5 per treated ton as an additional cost. So again, you'll see that's not a significant add-on cost um, because that's what many of you perhaps do for a living. I can tell you what the cost to mix it is. Um, I suspect you've got your own number that you'd like to apply there. So that's another reason why I left that specific metric out. So getting back up to the top of the um, the spreadsheet, looking at the second column titled non-hazardous waste. The cost of the Blastox material in super sacks is around $300 per ton. If you're applying it on a 5% ad rate basis, 5% of $300 is $15 per 
per treated ton of soil. Freight and disposal is about $50 per ton. The combined cost to add the material or the cost for the reagent and disposal is $65 per ton. Throw in another $5 per ton to mix it. So we're looking at about $70 per ton. Looking at hazardous waste, where freight is going to be about $50 per ton. And this was a pretty, uh, th this was a hazardous waste landfill that was lower on cost than many of the other landfills that I've seen. But this was a real number from the landfill here in the Midwest of $130 per ton. So the combined cost for hazardous waste in that third column from the left, titled hazardous waste, is $180. You simply subtract the two, and the savings using blast stocks is $115 per ton. So you can see if you're doing a project of 1,000 tons and you're saving $100, it's 100,000 tons that you've just saved by avoiding the high cost of hazardous waste uh, disposal. And what I'm finally going to do here is I just got a couple more slides um, that give a good flavor for the types of heavy metals and what the ad rate was given what the leachable rate was for the heavy metals. Uh, we had a project down in the St. Louis area that was a former auto assembly plant. They had an e-coat application um, process that was set up that required lead to be present in the, those materials. And then they generally just had a burn pile area where this would predates EPA and the existence of a lot of waste management regulations. So as a result, it was very common to put them all in one large hole in the ground or a trench and burn them. Well, that's what happened here. But as that property became potentially more valuable from real estate in the area going up in value, they decided to clean up the area. Well, they did tests and they determined that lead leached at greater than 100 milligrams per liter. At that high rate, we tested it and did a treatability study and determined that 4% of our standard blast stocks 215 was quite effective. In a similar application, but in a different urban setting, this one up in Chicago area, where they were going to build a school, which if you think about an elementary school with children, immediately the term sensitive receptor pops to mind because you simply you certainly want to make sure you don't have any lead in the area and you want to make sure that's been thoroughly cleaned. So this we thought was a very good project for us because um, of its unique nature with having a school built on top of this property. Well, it was a wide range that we had from a low of 6.3 milligrams per liter for lead up to almost 200 milligrams per liter. So again, keep in mind the slide where I'd said 50 to 100 may need 5%. Again, I tried to be conservative there, and you can see here that ranges that exceeded that, we were able to stabilize it with a 4% average dose rate. And finally, this was a very unique project up in the Twin Cities, Minnesota area. Uh, it was unique in that it used Superfund dollars because they, they didn't have other monies available to clean this area up. But more importantly, if you look at the second bullet point, it had both hexavalent chromium and cadmium. Now, hexavalent chromium doesn't have the amphotericy phenomena that lead and cadmium do. If you remember the solubility curve that we discussed earlier, Lead had a minimum solubility of nine and a half, 9.5 on the pH scale, and cadmium had a minimum solubility range of around 11. Well, chromium doesn't have that issue. So we have a material that, that's worked, that's used quite effectively with chromium. That material is a little acidic in nature. So when we added that to the waste, it brought the pH of the waste matrix well beneath the minimum solubility range for cadmium, which would have been 11. In fact, the pH range was around seven. So 
the scenario was set up, if we were simply modifying the pH, our materials would not have worked in the dual purpose of stabilizing the chromium and the cadmium. So we were able to develop a, a mixture that contained our 215 and the reduction oxidation enhancement that we added. This particular product brand was called Chrome Tox because of the need to stabilize the chromium as well as the cadmium. And as you can see, the chromium was above its regulatory limit of five. Here it was 12. And the cadmium was above five where the value for the regulatory value for cadmium is one milligram per liter. So this was a really unique application where our material achieved stabilization with two heavy metal species that really require different stabilization mechanisms. But what the real purpose in me mentioning this here is, it's clear that we're not simply adjusting pH because we were able to stabilize a cadmium in a much lower pH environment that was more conducive for the stabilization of, of chromium. And that concludes our webinar here today.